opportunity to introduce you to the newest Archbishop in the Anglican Communion. His name is Archbishop Glenn Davies. He's from Sydney. And you've been doing this now about 11 days. How's your first week been? Uh, thank you, Kevin. Good to be with you. Thank you. Uh, my first week or so has been like a whirlwind. <laughs> a whole range of issues have come before me. And, but at the same time, it's been very exciting and energizing. That's good. You've fallen in the footsteps of uh, Archbishop Peter Jensen. And uh, I would have to say those are pretty big uh, shoes to fill. Uh, they're very big shoes to fill. You're quite right there. I have, I've had the privilege of working with Peter, firstly, on the faculty of Moore Theological College uh, for about 13 years, and now in the last 12 years as his assistant bishop. Mm -hmm. So we've worked together very well. I've learned a lot from him, and I'll, in many ways, I walk in his footsteps, but with, with smaller shoes. <laughs> You've, you were appointed bishop uh, by Archbishop Peter Jensen in 2001. Uh, what have you noticed to be some of the big spiritual needs of Sydney, Australia? I think for us the greatest challenge is in our secularistic society to bring the message of Jesus uh, powerfully and persuasively into our society. Uh, we have an unchanging gospel uh, grounded in the scriptures and we need to find new ways of bringing that gospel into the hearts and lives of people who live in Sydney and, and beyond. That's been our biggest challenge, and it continues to be our challenge, and probably not just for us, of course, uh, in the Western world, but all, all around the world as, as well. One of the things that we've uh, heard from Sydney over the last uh, 30 years is your desire, and I'm going to use this word incorrectly, of course, for a lay presidency, uh, or where lay people uh, oversee the Eucharist. And um, I was wondering if that's something you're going to try to introduce in your tenure, or um, can you explain exactly what you guys mean by lay presidency? Certainly. It, it'll be helpful for your viewers, mm -hmm. and no doubt for you, uh, to recognize the, the vocabulary, uh, the importance of vocabulary here. Okay. We don't, if I can say this, we don't believe in lay presidency. Mm -hmm. That's very, we don't believe in diaconal presidency. We believe that the president, to use that term, it's a modern term, of course, uh, the one who has the authority over the celebration of the Lord's Supper is the presbyter or the priest uh, under the bishop. Now, what we do believe, though, is that it's possible for a deacon or a layperson to administer the Lord's Supper under the authority of the presbyter. That's, that's the, we've, we've always taken that line, but it's been so frequently misinterpreted and misunderstood because of the language of presidency. Sure. So uh, it's interesting. In the Book of Common Prayer, uh, it's the it, the service is called the Holy Communion or Lord's Supper, the administration of the Holy Communion right. and the Lord's Supper, and therefore that administration is important. So, in the Book of Common Prayer, when a deacon baptizes a child, an infant, he does so on the authority of his priest. He doesn't do it in his own authority, and so there you've got a sacrament being administered by a deacon, but under the authority of of the priest. So we've always taken that view, but it has not been well received or well understood. <laughs> However, I, I should say that just to give a bit of history here, sure. uh, as you said, 30 years we've been discussing this in our diocese, and there have been motions at Synod, and uh, there was even an ordinance passed in Synod, which the Archbishop of the day declined to sign. But at the end of the 90s, last century, the, there was a, a, a proposition put to our appellate tribunal, which is the highest ecclesiastical court in the Anglican Church of Australia, which has uh, uh, three bishops and four uh, uh, lay people who are uh, normally uh, lawyers or judges, as the case may be, and they, they gave their opinion that lay and diaconal administration of the Lord's Supper was consistent with the teaching of Scripture, the teaching of the Book of Common Prayer, and the teaching of the 39 Articles. That was a, that was a landmark decision of our national church. Mm. Secondly, they said it can only be introduced by way of a general synod canon. Uh, because the question was phrased, can it be introduced by a general synod canon? They said, yes, it could be, and it needed to be done along those lines. So that's where we, that's where we are in, in, the, in the present situation. I myself, uh, there was another question put towards the general synod, uh, appellate tribunal, with regard to whether, whether there was already an existing canon namely the ordination of deacons canon, uh, if that was permissible to allow diaconal administration. And I argued that case before the appellate tribunal. Unfortunately, they did not agree with me, 
or at least uh, six of the seven didn't agree with me. And so our current situation is the opinion of the appellate tribunal is that we are not able, under a general synod canon, that not, none exist, uh, to allow either diaconal or lay administration. Interesting. Now, I've been trying to catch up on who is the real Glenn Davies by reading Sydney Press. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, from what I can tell, they don't know what to make of you. On one side of the coin, you are the, the one person who's going to uh, wipe out all of Peter Jensen's bad decisions, and you're going to retake Anglicanism for the liberal cause, and um, you, you're, you're the savior of uh, progressive Anglicanism. On the other hand, you're, you're going to be one of the, the staunch traditionalists and, and the worst thing that's ever happened to uh, Sydney Anglicanism. Um, what, what's the truth here? I haven't been reading those reports, so... <laughs> which, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> I'm sure it is good. I, I am I'm an Anglican, mm -hmm. I'm an Evangelical, I'm Reformed in my theology. Mm -hmm. uh, the three come together for me. Anglicanism is the, uh, in my view, the most consistent policy with regard to the Scriptures. Mm -hmm. Not the only policy available, mm -hmm. it's the most consistent in my view. And it, is, it, it, and it can function extremely well, but like all good structures, it, it can also function poorly. Right. And we've seen that happen in recent days around the world. Uh, I'm a cultural Anglican. I was brought up, I was baptized uh, uh, when I was uh, an infant and in my local Anglican church. And I've grown up. I studied overseas, as you probably know, at Westminster Seminary. Mm -hmm. So people think I'm a closet Presbyterian. Um, but Philip E. Hughes, the uh, classic Anglican scholar, was... A visiting professor mm -hmm. and my own personal chaplain oh, when wow. I was at Westminster. Okay. So I've got a strong connection with Anglicanism even whilst I was in America, and, and that's probably important for some for some to realise. I'm deeply uh, I'm, I'm uh, deeply steeped in the theology of the reformers and uh, of the Bible itself. The reformers, of course, are not a, a separate authority. They unleashed and, and liberated the the apostolic teaching of the New Testament. And that's where I, I, I find myself grounded, and therefore I align myself with most of the Protestant Reformation creeds and confessions, and, uh, and yet I want to see myself as a 21st century Christian, not just living in the 16th century, but the 21st century, so certain changes necessarily come. I, I was a strong advocate, for example, in our diocese in the 90s as a local parish clergyman, to admit children to the Lord's Supper prior to confirmation. Mm. And I believe that's a, a, a thoroughly biblical perspective and one which possibly our, our Anglican forebears uh, got wrong. Although there was a caveat that you could, if you were desirous of being confirmed, you could take part in the Lord's Supper, but uh, it was normally seen as confirmation was the gateway. And to have confirmation, which is not a biblical right, as to prevent people uh, from taking communion, I thought was a, a mistake. It is. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a reformist. I suppose semper reformanda is my catchword. Not reformed, but reforming. Always reforming. Very good. Now, you're going to be one of the three dozen uh, or so leaders of the Anglican Communion. Um, what does the average Sydney Anglican know about the fracture or what's happening globally in Anglicanism? I think that most of our Anglican lay people are fairly well informed with regard to the fracture that began 10 years ago, of course, in 2003 with the election of Gene Robinson. But of course, it was already taking place before that, as we all know. And uh, it just, that was the great point of fracture uh, with regard to his consecration. Uh, yes, our lay people are well aware of that and are aghast that people could follow that viewpoint uh, and and say it was consistent with the teaching of scripture uh, we're fairly strong in our in our belief that the scripture gives to us god's guidelines for today and his ethical demands have not changed in that regard as the freshman archbishop uh, do you have any advice for the other primates in the anglican communion how we can uh end this current fracture and get back together or um, do you have any advice? It's a well, big question. 
It is a big question, and far be it from me, yeah. an Archbishop of uh, 11 days old, to be giving advice to uh, primates, let alone other Archbishops. <laughs> so uh, I think that my, my advice would be to anyone who asked me the question, what, what's the way forward? Mm -hmm. It seems to me the Anglican Communion is going to survive, and the Anglican Communion has to, has to make sure that its, its roots are firmly established in the Scriptures, uh, doctrinally in the 39 Articles and liturgically expressed in the Book of Common Prayer. Mm -hmm. Now that is very much the, the, the bedrock of the Jerusalem Declaration, as you know, and if you cannot abide by that, then you should really say, I'm not an Anglican, and you should go somewhere else. Form your own denomination if you need to. If the Archbishop of Canterbury is going to call Anglicans, he needs to call them as those who believe the Scriptures to be the final authority in all matters of faith and conduct. And that seems to me to be where we should be going. Very good. You mentioned uh, uh, the Jerusalem uh, Declaration. Uh, upcoming in October is the next GAFCON. Uh, Peter Jensen uh, was and still is the Secretary General uh, of Correct. GAFCON, uh, Secretary, or General Secretary sorry, of GAFCON. Um, what will your, your role be at GAFCON? Uh, it is not entirely clear to me at the moment. Uh, I've been invited to uh, attend uh, the, uh, the the Primates Council uh, as an observer, because, uh, because I'm not a primate, obviously. And uh, at that level, I'll have those conversations with, with the, the leadership team. Uh, at the moment, I'm not sure whether I'm going to be involved in the, the communique, the writing of the communique. I, as you know, I was involved in the, in the formation of the De Jerusalem Declaration in 2008, and in the communique, last year in London for the, for the leadership conference that which we had. And Peter Jensen and I have been talking about this, what's the best way forward, whether it's time now for new blood to come in and uh, take a, a role at that level. All right, let's finish up here. What things do you wish to accomplish in your tenure as uh, uh, the, the Archbishop of Sydney? Well, I think that my first, our, our goal in all things is to glorify God. Mm -hmm. If, um, if I have glorified God in my, my way of life, in the decision that I have made, in the effect that I have in, in our city, then that will, that will give me great joy. Uh, that's why God has put me in this place, to glorify Him. And I have to do that to, uh, to, be a, 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 to lead the diocese as a loving community. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes Sydney can be fractured by uh, arguing over gnats and, and camels. And we need to be unified in saying we've got a great saviour and a great gospel to bring to the world. And we have so many resources to do that, that we should be galvanised in our understanding and under undertaking to bring the message of Jesus to as many people as possible. At the same time, to build up the people of God in a strong understanding of the Bible so that they will have be strengthened when forces of evil come, uh, come, come their way, that they'll be able to stand firm uh, on the rock of the apostolic truth. So that's, that's, if, if those things can be accomplished in my time, I'll be very pleased. Archbishop Glenn Davies, I want to thank you for your time. I hope we get to do this again in the future. Uh, people, viewers may not know, but there's daylight in the back of Archbishop <laughs> Glenn Davies' view because it's uh, 11.30 a.m. there and it's 9.30 p.m. back here at Anglican TV Studios in, in Connecticut. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, Kevin. God bless. Thank you.